so I was interviewing someone yesterday and they said something really interesting and they said, and I think this was from, I'm not sure what culture it was from, but they were saying, whenever you have mentors, you should always have a, a mentor that's older than you and a mentor that's younger than you. Because the mentor that's older is maybe further along the road and can teach you certain things. But the mentor that's younger than you is basically kicking you up the butt <laughs> to go, okay, yeah. I need to like really up my game. This guy, this woman, she's coming along really, really fast. This is Super Fast Business with James Schramko. James Schramko. Helping you build your business super fast. 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 James Schramko here. Welcome back to superfastbusiness.com. Today I have a special guest, mostly because his name is the same as mine, which makes it easy to remember. Welcome, James Taylor. It's my pleasure being here. Nice to speak to another James today. You've had me on your show before and you're a prolific marketer and you're doing great things in a few different areas, especially for creative people. And some of the work we've been doing together, I've been uh, watching you craft fantastic solutions for people who want to develop their business and maybe had an artistic angle. But the thing that really caught my attention is just a casual remark you made inside the super fast business membership. And that was that you were using artificial intelligence to help you create your keynote presentations. And I was like, what would you come and talk to my audience about this topic? Because I think that was really interesting. And, and, you know, today's episode is how AI can be used by marketers to increase performance. So just before we dive right into that, I just think it'd be worth you giving a little bit of preface to uh, where does James Taylor find out about AI and why should we be listening to you about this subject? Yes, I've come at marketing from a slightly circuitous route. I started off my career managing rock stars and then pop artists. So when, you know, when I left school, I, I got into artist management pretty early on, managing big club nights, you know, a lot of dance music. And so I had a great opportunity. I got a chance to manage you know, some great kind of platinum selling artists, Grammy Award winners. I got a chance to work with members of the Rolling Stones, Jeff Beck. And then... I kind of went through that as a career and I, I was always very interested in the marketing element because essentially when you're building up an artist's career, you're building a brand and marketing is a key component of that. And then in 2010, I was asked to move to California to the San Francisco Bay Area to take my skills from really understanding the music industry and entertainment and applying that into the online education world. And so I moved there. Um, uh, one of the original guys who'd been at AOL had started a business and uh, it was involved in creating online membership sites around teaching music online. So stuff that, you know, many of your your listeners will be very kind of familiar with. And so over the course of about three years, we created about 30 online membership based sites for uh, my role was really to go out and find this great talent, these Grammy award winning music artists. And then we essentially created an online membership based site around their brand. And that's kind of what we did. And we did it for a number of years and, and that company is still going and it was really exciting. And then I got a bit bored <laughs> so as you do, as you kind of get that entrepreneurial itch after a little while as well. So I decided to take a year off, did a bit of traveling. My wife and I went around Asia and different places. And then when I started coming back to it, I initially actually started coming back into the world of running live events because I came from that. I love that experience of being alive. And what I started really noticing is in terms of where a lot of online education is going is that hybrid model where someone might be a member of something, a member of a, a membership site, for example, but then there's also a live component, some kind of live event. And so that's what I started doing. I started doing that with other people in the in music, but then started moving out into the world of people who were more thought leaders and speakers and helping them create those, both the live events and live retreats, smaller events, and also kind of memberships as well. And then that strangely brought me into the world of then being a keynote speaker myself, because as you kind of get to learn about the world of keynote speaking, you quickly learn that these kind of these two tribes in the, in the speaking world, there's the the tribe of the, we call them kind of platform speakers, people who are selling from the stage something. So they might give an hour's presentation and the last 45 minute 15 minutes is they're kind of selling, they're coaching, they're consulting or something. And that's a great model. And, and some of the most successful speakers out there are what I would call platform speakers. But then there's this completely other type of model, which is called is more classic keynote speakers, the people who get paid the 10, 15, 20 thousand dollars just to go up and give a 45 minutes, an hour speech on something. They're not really selling from the stage. And that's where I started getting involved. 
And I was able to transition my online marketing skills into that space because it's a really strange thing. The online, a lot of the online marketers gravitate towards a platform, say, sell, uh, the platform speaking side, which is great. But there's this other side, the keynote speaking side, and there's actually, strangely, there's less people who have come from the online marketing moving into that space. Maybe because they feel a bit intimidated because it's larger companies you're dealing with. But it's just, it's a fascinating place to go into. And then as I start getting involved in that, you want to get really good at your skill and develop mastery in it. And uh, I was running a retreat in California, one of our retreats, and there was a gentleman there from IBM Watson. And uh, he, we were just talking about things and he was telling me about I, AI and IBM Watson. And uh, I thought, I wonder if I can use this for my my speaking. Uh, I wonder how that could work. And that's how I kind of <laughs> started on in using AI on the speaking. That's a fantastic journey. It's the second time I heard about IBM Watson in a week. The other time I heard it was when I was sitting on a private conference call in uh, as a special guest with the invitation to be an advisor for a blockchain company that is integrating into IBM Watson to help write contracts for people in a particular industry where the outputs had numerous possible outcomes, if that makes sense, without spoiling the topic. Uh, but the key that I got was they're plugging into this machine and the machine will be able to go beyond where you're going with your standard sort of concatenation type formulas that a lot of script writing type tools use where they just, you know, pull A, B, C, or D, and then the next yeah. line, A, B, C. Like we went through this with the SEO industry with spinning software, but it sounded, yeah, I remember it sounded that. <laughs> like, uh, you know, this Watson is able to go beyond that, and I don't know anything about it. So I would be really curious, like when we're talking about AI and IBM Watson, what is it? How would you explain it to someone who you met on the street or in a cafe who doesn't know about it? Sure, but probably the first time people would have maybe heard of IBM, um, and let's say Watson, but let's say artificial intelligence was when uh, in 1991, uh, there was a famous chess match with Gary Kasparov, of the world's greatest chess player. And it happened in New York and he was playing against the kind of the one before uh, IBM Watson. It's called Deep Blue. It's a supercomputer. It's an artificial intelligence. And what IBM wanted to do is they wanted to see, could a computer do the kind of complex cognitive tasks that we'd always associated with us as, as human beings? So it said you know, one of the most difficult games to play is the game of chess. And so they put their IBM supercomputer with AI up against Gary Kasparov, the chess player. And what was really interesting is everyone thought, oh, that's fine. That's really nice. It'll be a, you know, Kasparov is the world's greatest chess player. You know, it's, you know, it's five times easier to become a billionaire than it is to beat Gary Kasparov at chess. So, you know, this computer, that's, that's interesting. It's a bit of fun, but I'll get some news, but it's not really a thing. So what happened is in the first game, Kasparov did a, a move called the King's Indian Attack, able to take the advantage. But in the second game, he just kind of lost his concentration a little bit and the AI started taking advantage. So there's essentially a gentleman there who was moving the chess pieces at the instruction of the AI. It was the AI that was, what it was doing is it was calculating, using calculating 200 million moves per second using brute force logic. So no human can do that. But where the human normally leads is as humans, we're very good at pattern recognition. We're very good at strategy. We're very good at creativity. But what happened is towards the end of those games, the AI, the IBM actually managed to beat Gary Kasparov. And when it, beat Kasparov, there was like audible gasps in the room because people were just so shocked <laughs> that an AI could do this. So that was the first big time when that happened. And why this is important for anyone listening here, think, oh, that's that nice, for, you know, game shares. It's because they, they estimate that nearly 50% of jobs over the next 20 years are either going to disappear or going to be fundamentally changed because of AI and automation. And one of the industries that's going to be most changed is the world of marketers. If you go onto a site called Replace by Robots, it'll actually, if you type in your job description, let's say you're, um, you're an online marketer or you're, um, maybe you do specialize in email marketing, you will see the percentage chance of your job being replaced by a machine. If you're an email marketer, incredibly high. So what happened is, is AI started getting used for that as a bit of a test case. And then we started seeing used in pharmaceuticals, more complex tasks um, in the big corporate. And now what we're starting to see is AI entering the world of that, you know, you and I 
as marketers as not that don't have billion dollar companies can start to use. And it's you know it, it's essential what they're trying to do. You know, we hear when we talk about artificial intelligence, this horrible thing of people thinking it's going to be like a Terminator type of thing that's going to kill us all or something. That's not what we're fundamentally talking about. We're over the next 20 years, what we're really talking about is many of those routine analytical type of tasks that we do every single day are going to be replaced by AI doing those tasks. Now, that will hopefully allow us as, as the humans in the relationship to be able to do those higher quality tasks. I mean, you, you speak about, you know, work less, make more. The AI is the perfect part. It's almost like, you know, we, you know, 10 years ago, we all moved to using CRMs like Entreport or HubSpot, you know, HubSpot or Infusionsoft. This is basically the next generation for us as marketers. So we're seeing that with many chat and Facebook chat bots, um, <laughs> yeah. which interestingly have had a bit of a slap in the face recently with the data breach that Facebook has mm -hmm. discovered. They've sort of stopped people rolling out new ones until they work out what they're learning. But you've raised a few points there. By the way, you're a fabulous guest because you just cover all the things I'm thinking to ask. <laughs> My first thing that I wanted to ask is if it's five times easier to be a billionaire than a chess master, mm -hmm. why aren't they using these things to become billionaires? I suppose some forex traders probably do, and yeah. they're not telling us. Yeah, they, they are. I mean, hedge funds are one of the earliest. If you look at some of the big investment firms now, they're saying that over the next few years, they're going to get rid of many of their investment managers and just replace them with AI. That's, that's already... I think that, Ray Dalio was talking yeah. about using algorithms in his book, Principles, which is a very good book. And I had a guest on this show, Justin Brooke, was talking about using algorithms in marketing. But is it too simplistic to say that AI is like an algorithm that can think for itself? Yeah, I mean, the way AI is just now, I mean, we, people sometimes talk about things like your Amazon Alexa. I was talking to Chris Brogan, Mark, the other day, and, and he was saying he created his own little Amazon Alexa skill. Now, people think about that as AI. In truth, that's not real AI. You're just feeding it a whole bunch of things. And a lot of the chatbots we often think about is not really true AI. Where you're seeing a lot of AI being used at the moment is what we call kind of narrow artificial intelligence. So one particular task, let's say in finance, you'll give it tasks to find very small, quick trades to be able to do. And the AI can go to work very good on that. If you ask that same AI, OK, now compose me a piece of music or now create me a marketing campaign for this new product launch. It's not going to be able to do that. You have to have another AI for that. Then that's when we're quite far away from what we call general artificial intelligence, where you can have an AI that can do all these things. A little bit like we see with that. What's that movie? Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the movie with the guy. He has this kind of artificial intelligence kind of sidekick, Iron Man. We're not quite there yet. Where I think is we'll start to see how those algorithms play into what we do is you mentioned things like chatbot. So that's the kind of front end. Companies like Alibaba was biggest B2B marketing uh, marketplace. They use AI now for 95% of all their customer interactions. So if you're having an interaction with them from a customer service perspective, chances are you're having a conversation with an AI. The next stage that we start to move in is this sense of how you potentially convert people that are coming into your funnel. Let's say they've signed up for your opt-in page, your lead magnet. And then how do you take that person from that being like kind of cold, warmish kind of lead into actually a final sale? So converting. That's when you're starting to see things like we call conversational AI being used. There's a great company you can check out called Conversica, and they have one of these. And I was talking to someone recently from CenturyLink, a big phone company in the US, and they basically took one of these conversational AIs and they fed it all of their opt-ins, the people that were kind of opting into all their various lead magnets and things. And they were getting a 2000% ROI on that in terms of taking those people from those relatively cold leads into paying customers with a you know lifetime value of that customer being about $400. So what it essentially was doing is if you go into Conversica, if you want to sign up for, and there's lots of different these conversational AIs out there now that companies are doing this, you know, sign up to get one of their, like a walkthrough Chances are the emails that you're going to be having correspondence with, it might be called Sally or Sue or Joan, that will be an AI that you're having those email correspondence with. What they're trying to do is they're, it's not necessarily that they have preset phrases that they're using, but they're kind of learning from you. They're pulling, seeing certain triggers from you to know how warm you are 
to potentially getting on a call with a salesperson. And that's essentially what they're doing. And so the calls that those eventual human salespeople are doing, they're much more qualified. They've gone through many of the other stages and they're only really starting to do calls with people that they know the hottest. And those are aren't really hot particular prospects they're going to move into a slightly separate funnel and continue more with ai and so we think that okay that's really cool and that's century link that's big big companies but this stuff now is getting down to the point of i think it's about like four thousand dollars a month to have your own conversational ai so imagine if you can have a salesperson who never sleeps <laughs> who's just every time you bring in that lead and especially for membership sites uh, sites like uh, bomb bomb they make a i think you use bonjoro which is a video type app to send quick video messages. BombBombs is a similar kind of version. I use BombBomb. And they have a membership program for people to sign up, mostly for realtors, but some for speakers as well. And they're using a conversational AI to warm up those cold leads in order to get them on to either a sales call or get them to purchase by clicking that buy button. And it's all happening through an AI. There's not a human interaction now. So because we're still a fair way away from that general AI that you're talking about, does that mean Skynet is not quite here yet? <laughs> It'll be a while until the AI can figure out that humans pretty much kill everything and they'll take us out? Yeah, that's not the biggest challenge that we have just now. I mean, there are... We're seeing all these things going on Facebook just now. And part of the problems that are going on in terms of those privacy is the technology was going so fast, so moving so fast that people weren't really having those conversations about ethics, frankly. And that's slightly different in the AI world because people are recognizing how powerful this could potentially be, especially when you start to move into you know, defense contractors and things like that as well. Those conversations and those groups and those panels, people like Elon Musk and others are kind of assembling groups. And there's a big one at uh, Oxford University where they're assembling those groups to look at what are the laws, what are the things that we need to do in order to protect people. But the idea of AIs coming along and us being essentially the house cats for artificial intelligence, that's a long way off. What you need to be more concerned about is as a marketer, as an entrepreneur, how you can best harness and also ensure that not only do you survive in this new age of artificial intelligence, but also you can thrive. You can essentially use this as a new tool in your toolkit. And that's actually the most exciting stuff. I think so often as marketers, we get caught up in the tactical, you know, setting up that campaign, setting up that opt-in page, doing all that stuff. IBM Watson now have a, a marketing suite, which is essentially used to create, take maybe 30 days to create a, one of these big, complex, multi-channel marketing campaigns. The AI is doing it in less than 24 hours. So imagine that in, in your, let's say, if it takes you two weeks to set up a launch, you've got a product launch, you're launching some membership, you're launching something, a book. Imagine being able to take that same amount of time and have it compressed. And so then our question then becomes, well, what is our role as the human in that? If the AI is able to do many of these tactical things and our role, going back to Gary Kasparov, after he lost that game of chess, what happened was he went to a pretty dark place. So imagine what it would feel like just now if you consider yourself, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a great marketer, and suddenly a machine can come along and do it faster, cheaper and better than you. How is that going to feel? <laughs> I mean, James, I don't know. Well, I'd be okay with it. I would just want to tap into it. You want to tap into it. Exactly. Which is exactly. You know, like my car gets me somewhere faster than I can and I, I don't have an issue with it. I harness and embrace that. Exactly. But a lot <laughs> and, of people don't. You know, my internet connection lets me speak to people all around the world, which I can't do by myself. So I embrace it. I, don't, I, I love the part where you said it can be tools, but I really need to understand two things. I want to know. How do you actually do it? Mm -hmm. Because I know what it's called now. I know where I might go to sort of find out. But like, what do you actually have to do to make it work? And what kind of things can we have it do? You've already sort of given us an idea that it could help us with funnels and it could help us with conversations that might be having like a, a support type role. But how do you actually, like you're listening to this, you go, yeah, I get it. James Taylor, you've given me an idea. A light bulb's gone off. I'm going to go over and check out uh, Watson. But what happens? You go to the website and then what? Yeah. So do you go to IBM Watson? They have a, a different suite. And there's other companies, not just Watson. Microsoft have their own version as well uh, called Corsana. <laughs> Does theirs work? Um, uh, well, actually, they're... <laughs> Didn't someone have one that went a bit rogue? Yes. Yeah. This is the thing. We're kind of a little bit in the Wild West. It's not quite as bad as, you know, the 
the early 90s in the internet marketing world when there was lots of those long pages with the yellow highlighter oh, stuff. God, uh, and red headlines. Red head- and- <laughs> <laughs> All that. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit like that. And it's a little bit like, you know, in the, in the 2000s apps, you know, became and suddenly with lots of app built in it. So I think one of those robots became like a communist or something. Yeah. Um, with political slants. This is the interesting thing. When you start getting to, a- to the AI, let's imagine if you have a child and you start teaching it all these incredible things and you're instilling all your knowledge that you have and you're passing all this all this on and you're hopefully teaching it the child values but at some point in their life maybe when they hit kind of puberty they kind of go actually i have a completely different set of goals from you i want to do other things and that's the slightly danger with ai is that we can get to a point where with ai it can say okay those goals are all very good. This is what you want to do. But actually, I have completely separate goals for myself. That's the threat piece. But just kind of bring it back to like, that's kind of ground it in. Actually, if someone's, you know, listening to this just now, how they can do, I'm going to use the example of, of speaking because it's the area that the keynote speaking area I know the best. Yes, that's the exact example yeah. that triggered my interest as someone who every month puts together a keynote for my own audience. Yeah. Is there something that I could apply yeah. from this podcast that would help me? I'm going to take you through how I do a keynote and I'll, and I'll show you how the AI bit comes in. Because when I say to people I'm using AI for my keynote, they think, oh, that's great. You're cheating because you just basically had the AI write the speech. And that's not what I'm doing at all. I'm using it as a tool. This is my process for how I write a speech or a keynote. You could use it whether you're giving a keynote to a thousand people or whether you're giving a presentation, a sales presentation. It doesn't really matter. This is the kind of the steps that I do. So the first thing I always do is going back to the human part is I'm having a conversation with the client I'm speaking to. So I'm getting on that call having a conversation with the CEO of the company or the vice president of sales or marketing, whoever's really bringing me in to speak to their organization. So, and I'm trying to find what are the emotions that you want me to bring out in the people, you know, what you want them to feel, what do you want them to have learned by the time they've left? So that's the kind of the initial human part. Then I do the other human bit as well, which I actually sit down on my backside with a cup of tea because I'm in the UK, and ideate and just think. Think through this, the stuff that we're amazing. We've taken all this information about a subject. You might be a subject matter expert, but you want to be coming up with your own ideas and your own thoughts around it. So I ideate. And then start doing like a brain dump, writing stuff down. So this is all even before the, I bring the AI into it. I'm researching as a keynote speaker. I'm using probably more stories than maybe other types of speakers. I'm using also a lot of visuals in what I'm doing in terms of my presentation because I know that stories are going to make people listen, but it's visuals that will make them remember. So I have to have that visual component to what I'm doing with the stories. Then what I do is I start to essentially kind of write my first version of my speech, get the structure and write the first version. When I've done the first version of my speech, the very basic version, and it's going to be the same as a PowerPoint presentation, I will then do what I call a table read. And this goes to what actors do, where you'll do a, a reading of it so you can feel what it feels like to be presenting this particular pitch, this particular kind of presentation. I'll then do a second draft of that, making all the changes I want to make. And then when I've got that second draft in text form, I will then go into IBM Watson and they have one key tool you want to use there. It's called personality insights. So because I know who I'm speaking to, let's say if I'm speaking to uh, like the other day, I was speaking to a thousand B2B marketers at a conference. These B2B marketers are a little bit different from B2C marketers in that they tend to be a bit more analytical. They're talking about big numbers, sometimes the un- called the unsexy part of marketing, B2B marketers. I can believe it. I think the amazing stuff. So what I would do is I would take the Twitter accounts of the association or the organization I'm speaking to. Let's say they've got 20,000 Twitter followers. I will then essentially I can just take that handle, that Twitter handle of that association, put it into IBM Watson. It will give me a visual representation on a graph, like almost like a circle with like 76 different personality characteristics of the audience. So I can see from just looking at that one graph what the personality of the overall audience is in the room. So I'll give you an example. When I was giving that B2B, that speech that B2B marketers, the areas that were much higher than I would normally expect to see them were around things like wanting things to be proven. So obviously they're coming from a more statistical background. Many of these people, there's a lot of data analysts at that type of conference. So they're wanting me to be using much more stats, much more data to support what I'm saying. 
I spoke the week before that to a room of authors, thought leaders, experts. They want much more like almost like integrity as in why are you up there on stage? What is it that brings you to that point? Like more heart centered stuff. And I can see that from a visual representation. So imagine almost being able to have a bit of a cheat in some ways, being able to see exactly who your audience is and what is important to them. Then what I do is I take my keynote, that text, copy that text and paste the text into IBM Watson's, their program is called the same personality insights. And then that will give me exactly the same, the visual representation of the personality of my keynote. Then what I do is I overlay the personality of my keynote with the personality of the audience. And it will very quickly then show me, ah, oh, okay, James, you're not hitting enough here around, uh, let's say trust. This audience wants much more trust involved. So I'll figure out how to bring that into a story. Or this audience wants much more about community feeling. And these are all different kind of personality types. And then so I've got that. I've got that information. That then allows me to go and start doing a third draft of my PowerPoint based upon that new data that I have in. So I have this tool that's essentially allowing me to kind of see into the minds of the audience I'm speaking to and know that I'm going to be hitting all the different points because the social media accounts are just reflective. This is what we're finding with Facebook. They're reflective of the people and their personalities. Once I do that, I go back to the human part of me again and I do what we call beats and transitions. That's like oratory type devices where I, I want to ensure that I'm like a musician at certain points, they kind of ramp up, they'll increase the volume or they'll, they'll, there's a transition between one song to another. I'm doing exactly the same thing. I'm learning how do I transition from this story to this story? Then I'll do blocking, which is where if I'm speaking, at, let's say I've got a particular story and it really gets down to be a personal type of thing, then I want to be at this part of the stage and I want to be presenting in this type of way. Then I'll do my performance stuff where I'll memorize it. I'm checking for my cadence. I'm trying to get rid of all those ums and ahs and all the stuff that you do there. I then fill in that. My speaking mentor, get feedback from that. I rework then based upon that and memorize that. And then I go out and perform it and give that keynote. But the thing I want to stress here, you can see the AI is right in the center of that. But it's not the only part. What they call centaur. I'm at your it is a half man, half beast character. This is what Gary Kasparov, all the great chess players do now. A set, what they call a centaur chess player will beat any human chess player any day of the week, which is a centaur chess is a human paired with an AI that will be any chess player any day of the week. And it'll also be any AI working on its own any day of the week. This is what we can do, whether you're marketers or speakers, you basically can use your, the thing you're amazing at as a human, your creativity, your strategic thinking, your imagination, and then combine that with this incredible tool of being able to use AI to create something. So in the audience, that audience member just feels that your speech lands with them and feels that they're talking to you. You're speaking in their language. You're speaking in their lingo. It's kind of weird. And then you will see this coming back in terms of your ratings from speaking because the people will say things in their ratings like, wow, it felt like he was really talking to me or he really understood, you know, the thing. And it's kind of a bit weird. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm showing you kind of behind the scenes of it as well. And some people feel, well, that that feels very manipulative. But really what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to be a great presenter, great speaker and a great marketer and marketing always comes from asking you know, the Ryan Levesque stuff, ask, ask what your audience wants. Don't try and necessarily impose what you think your audience wants. And that's where it comes back to the AI. It kind of reminds me of the tool that I found out about when I was at Ryan's Ask workshop, and that was Tag Crowd, where you paste in text and it pops up a little word cloud. Mm -hmm of the most commonly used words. It sounds like Watson's doing something very similar, but with personalities. And it's giving you some kind of detail like you might expect to see in your Facebook page analytics or your Google analytics. It shows you male, female, education level, those sort of stats. Yeah. How much does Watson cost? So this is the bizarre thing. Most of it, well, much of it is free. If you go on to IBM Watson, they have a thing called Bluemix. And just look for Blue Mix, and you can get many of these tools for free. It's a very interesting time because it's they've been primarily working with en large enterprise companies. So some of my friends that are involved in the IBM, they are working with like large pharmaceutical companies, for example. 
now they're starting to transition into more um, kind of the entrepreneurial space and smaller type of companies as well. So they're looking for thought leaders all the time, uh, for people that can show examples of how they're using this. So, for example, I was talking to Brian Fanzo the other day. Brian Fanzo and I were speaking at an event together. Brian Fanzo is a, a real leader in using social media and millennial marketing. And so he's part of one of the influencer groups at IBM. So they're looking for people, I mean, people that are listen, listening to this just now who are experts in their area. I'll give you another example. There was a movie that came out last year or two years ago, maybe year, last year, called Morgan. And what they did with Morgan, uh, did you see that movie? No, I saw movies like She and I've watched Black Mirror and I feel like they've been giving good sort of viewpoints as to where things could potentially go. Yeah, so here's the interesting part about that Morgan movie. So they, they estimate by the end of this year, 20% of business content would have been authored by a machine. So no human would have created that content. That's white papers, that's SMS messages, that's email messages. A machine would have authored that, an AI would have authored that. So with Morgan, what they decided to do is like, let's feed into IBM Watson the 100 or 200 best horror movie trailers. And let's see if IBM Watson can figure out what the commonalities are between all these trailers. So they fed in like 200 great horror movie trailers. And then what they did is they fed in all the raw material from the Morgan movie and the AI created a trailer, a three minute trailer, which you can go, if you go online to YouTube, you can watch the Morgan trailer. That trailer was created by an AI. And here's the thing. It is as scary as any other trailer you're going to see. It's an amazing trailer. And that took them, normally a trailer will take 10 to 30 days to create a movie trailer. That trailer was created in, in around 24 hours. So if they're doing that with something as complex and as big budget as a movie trailer, then think what they could be doing with other types of content marketing. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. I think I remember hearing about that, but I don't watch horror movies, <laughs> which is probably what's <laughs> stopped me. Um, that's what, when I heard you talk about the keynote, I remember – I know they've fed uh, this stuff in to make movies. They've created little chatting softwares. The episode of Black Mirror is where that person passed away and they've fed his um, account into the machine and then it started emulating this person yeah. and it basically replicated. That's already happening now. There's a, I was reading about a company yesterday. Now. Yes, and a lot of the – and those like robot dogs, those things, you know, they can open doors now. And I think that that was such a fascinating – series i watched every single episode and uh the social rating is happening in china yeah so if you haven't watched black mirror and you're listening to this uh, i would recommend you do just as a uh sort of step in this direction <laughs> yeah. um, but i'm going to go and check out watson and i'm going to feed in some things wouldn't it be fascinating to feed in my book transcription into the machine and see what it tells me yeah so i think what you would do is in your case you'd feed in First of all, give it your Twitter handle because there's all those other correspondence that's kind of going on there. Or maybe give it the um, the Twitter handles of some similar types of, let's say, there's uh, particular associations or well-known. Well, in Intercom, I've got the Twitter handles for all of the members of my membership. Perfect. So, you... so I could put in, you know, like quite a large sample yeah. size. Yeah, so that will feed in. That will give you a sense of your – I mean, you'll know it as an experienced marketer almost from a gut perspective. You'll know what those things are. But then having that visual representation of it and then feeding in whether it's your uh, speech you're going to give at next um, one of your next live events or your book, you can then feed that into there. And then you can see, OK, how closely do these overlay that? Now, the AI will then not go and teach you, tell you, OK, you need to add this chapter in and do this kind of stuff. But that's where you come in. That's, that's your job. That's what I was hoping it would do. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. In my world, everything that I do is transcribed because mostly I speak. Yeah. And then it turns into text. So I have transcriptions. You know, you could even punch in a few of my podcast transcriptions and see what's happening. So I'm interested to do this. Yeah, I was hearing the other day, and I don't know actually who it is. It's, uh, it's a coach in Australia, actually, who's created their coach AI. I think it's spent about a million dollars on it so far. And essentially allowing them, they're just feeding in all their thoughts, all their transcriptions, pretty much everything they've ever done, feeding into the AI so now when their coaching clients are doing their maybe their email coaching or their, you know, whatever, you know, online coaching they're getting from it, it's actually the AI coach that's giving that feedback because it knows the human, what that human coach, that well-known coach would have said so well, it can actually say that. That's leverage. That's fascinating to me. I mean, it does sound a lot like what Dale Beaumont's done with his app. 
I interviewed him on this podcast about Bryn, but he has had a brand change mm. and uh, he's right into this technology. But the thing that I've been doing is documenting my coaching notes for about nine years. I've written down notes every single session. So I know all the topics and the patterns, what comes up over and over again. And I think you're right that I would intuitively know most of what's happening. But the interesting thing is when I did the ask survey, a whole area came up that I wasn't creating an exact section for, and that was around team and scaling because it was so familiar to me. I wasn't experiencing the pain and awareness that my students have because a lot of them are small operations trying to get one or two or three or five people. And because I've been running teams for 20 years, it just didn't occur to me that it's such an issue. And the R survey brought that out. So I'm very interested to know what will be revealed that has been currently blind to me in the same way as the Johari window works, which is that area of the quadrant that I don't know. Mm. There's two areas, actually. I don't know. And Watson knows, <laughs> maybe. And then there's probably stuff that I don't know and Watson doesn't know, which we're yet to discover in the future. But I think that's an interesting point. I mean, you, that's, you're almost kind of pulling also on the role of a, a mentor there. Now, you're a mentor for me as part of the super fast business in terms of the online parts of what I do. In my speaking, I have two mentors. I have a mentor that works on my, the actual speech, the craft part of what I do, and a mentor that works on the, the kind of business and the sales part of what I do because he's, he's one of the most successful speakers in the world. He gets paid very large amounts of money to speak all over the world. And this is the thing I always think with that is, is it's so hard to see what's written on on the bottle when you're in the inside. Mm. You need to have that person that can reflect back to you what you just cannot see. So I, I'm a huge fan of just having having mentors. So I was interviewing someone yesterday and they said something really interesting and they said, and I think this was from, I'm not sure what culture it was from, but they were saying, whenever you have mentors, you should always have a, a mentor that's older than you and a mentor that's younger than you. Because the mentor that's older is maybe further along the road and can teach you certain things. But the mentor that's younger than you is basically kicking you up the butt <laughs> to go, yeah. okay, I need to like really up my game. This guy, this woman, she's coming along really, really fast. It is very interesting. And one thing that stands out when I'm doing things with you behind the scenes is how fast you execute. You're an excellent implementer, which means you get tremendous value from having these people around you because you actually pay attention and then do the things. And that implementation part cannot be understated. But I think that goes back to what you said just there, the team. That would be impossible for me to do if I didn't have a team. So I've got a team. In my case, I've got a team of uh, five, mostly in the Philippines, and they allow me to be able to implement at that fast rate. You know, think about the AI. The AI is going to be essentially going to be like another team member for me, and it's just going to be a pretty highly leveraged one. Because the way I think about it is I don't want to give a task to a human being if it's going to take time away from their families, if it's going to do stuff that I think is beneath them to do. I'd rather give that to a machine. Exactly. It's like I gave my team the logins for Trint. And whenever I do a podcast, they run it through Trint and the software turns those words into text. And that's their first draft for a transcription. Yeah. And it speeds up their process. But I don't want them sitting there <laughs> listening to me typing yeah. it word for word. Like, let them have a robot help them out. So this is embracing technology. And my team don't fear these tools. Whenever we can get a tool or a software or an automation that makes their job easier, it's not replacing them. It's just leveraging what we can do. That's why we're so fast. And I have a team of five just like you. And I can <laughs> like from the from the team of five club that we've got here, I could strongly endorse it. Yeah. I actually call it the Iron Man model when we talked about him before. And I actually heard some rumor that it was based on Elon Musk, but it's where you can basically have this suit that does all these amazing things. It helps you fly and shoot things down and <laughs> protects you from hard falls. So it's it just complements what you're doing. I think that you had a guest on a few weeks ago, um, uh, the gentleman from Mind Valley, And I think what I find really fascinating is this the AI thing. Okay, that's it can sound very technical and everything, but, and it's not at all. It's, I don't consider myself a technical person, really, but I'm able to use that tool. But it kind of comes back to what he was talking about was the reason he does things, the reason he builds companies, the reason that Richard Branson builds companies. is almost like this per there's a personal growth core to that as well. 
And AI takes away so much of the stuff that kind of gets in the way of you being able to focus on developing yourself and in developing your team as well. So I, I think where the really fascinating, so I call it centaur marketing or augmented creativity, is where we combine that real heart-centered, really the humanistic part of what we do that, that he was talking about as well with some of these you know, pretty cool, slightly futuristic technologies. Right, that was Vishen Lakhiani, and that was a Vishen. super popular episode because yeah. he was very generous with his thoughts. And also, it's a little bit different to your standard technical online marketing discussion, as this one is. And these are the sort of stories I want to bring to my audience. I want us to be on that bleeding edge of the bleeding edge. And if we're doing it for great reasons, isn't that a nice thing? We can sleep well at night. And I don't have any issue with the label of manipulation because if you ever need surgery, you want your surgeon to be manipulating those tools with precision. You want everything they do to be relevant to a positive outcome for you. And mm -hmm. if you're doing these things to be relevant and to help people, I think you actually said this in your speech framework, where do you want people to be after they've had that interaction? Then that's a noble mm -hmm. thing to be focused on. Yeah, it's intention. As long as you're going with, with, the, with the right intention and where we've seen some terrible things recently, especially in social media, you know, there was that, the, the British company uh, Cambridge Analytica recently uh, had some pretty terrible stuff is the intention was wrong. The technology is benign. And it didn't help that uh, that old quote from Zuckerberg about people being dumb fucks for giving him their <laughs> logins and that there was some other thing I read where at some point he may have used their logins into other things, emails to see if they were writing about him in the, the Harvard newspaper. This is all just alleged. I, I don't know the details on this, but it doesn't help. And you're right. Yeah, that tool was just a facade. It's a Trojan horse for some nefarious yeah. purpose. And that's where we have to be careful. Like you've got to have a good look at companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon and Apple. Between those people, they, they own pretty much all the data on everybody. And if something were to connect them, if they're not already, like with the CIA or something, then they have everything. There's nothing they don't know. Mm -hmm. Even like you can find someone based on if you know their pet these days and the geo data that's stuck in pictures that you post online on your phone reveal your house. I mean, everything is there. They yeah. already know all this. So we have to be careful. And I think old fogies like us, because we're not necessarily digital natives. I mean, we've lived with this and we work in this all the time. But We've lived without it and with it. And that's been a, yeah. a blessing. Yeah. And it, I think one of the interesting things from my friends and their kids is what I'm noticing some of the kids are doing is they're almost creating legends in the sense that we're a spy. If you work, for, if someone works for CIA or works for MI6 or MI5 or something, you have a legend. So there is the the real you, and then there's this other you that's created a legend. And I'm seeing a lot of young people almost doing this automatically now, creating their legend and having themselves and recognizing these are different things. Ready Player One, great book, which I know is just coming out as a, as a movie now as well with Steven Spielberg. It's really talking about that. We have these people having these two completely separate lives, the life that they keep hidden from technology, from social media, from places like that. And then the one that they put out into the world, the avatar of them as well. And I, I think that's going to be I think people are going to be much more protective of their privacy. And you're going to see much more of that going to going on. That's been really interesting. James, you have shared plenty of stuff with us. People can find out more about you at jamestaylor.me. And I do have to ask you, who do you think is the best rock band marketer <laughs> on the planet? Um, the best rock band marketer. It's so difficult because uh, I tend to think the artists, all the artists I've ever worked with, you know, the big sellers, they understand branding and they understand marketing. So sometimes the, what, the people that get the credit, whether it's the managers or the marketers, essentially the people that follow in behind them, it's the artists. So I would look at people, artists like Lady Gaga, for example, I think is a genius. Now she has an amazing manager behind us and has amazing managers, but I actually think it's sometimes the artists now because many of them have got the tools at their fingertips now. They don't necessarily need to go through a, a third party to be able to be kind of get their music and their message out into the world. Right. Maybe like Taylor Swift or someone like that as well. Yeah. I know Taylor's first manager and, you know, she, I mean, there's just a huge amount of skill and craft that's going on there. But Or Kanye. Yeah. Here's the thing. It's still a team. And this is the thing you mentioned you were at a Led Zeppelin gig the other night. So you as the audience, you see that one person or that those five people on stage. 
me as the manager, who's been managed, because I, I, I stand at the side of the stage getting to watch. And so I see the audience going mad, which is going great. Ten thousands of people out there. I see the, the artist up there that's creating. But when I look to my right, I see the hundreds of other people that are every bit as responsible for making that as a great show as the artist up on stage. I call that that's backstage creativity as opposed to on stage creativity. And I think, unfortunately, in our culture, the celebrity part puts that one person on the cover of the magazine or that entrepreneur on the cover of the magazine. And it doesn't give credit to the people that are behind the scenes. They're every bit as responsible for making that a great creative project, that making a great creative company. Yeah, that is interesting. I mean, in this case, I was there to see Robert Plant and the, the band that was supporting him were definitely secondary in my mind to the, the reason that I was there. And he was the one part of the Led Zeppelin that was on the stage but gee, it was a great performance. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, he'll have, I mean, I know some of the, the, the crew in that band and uh, there will be a crew of 50 to 100 people behind there. And then you're, you're seeing some people out front, like the sound engineers and, and stuff as well. And, you know, I've had it where we've taken bands on the road and there's been like multiple trucks and multiple buses. And we've had three nannies because now many of those artists, they all have kids and grandkids. And so you have to have <laughs> nannies on the road. And sometimes the nannies are more hard work than the actual rock stars. Well, wow, that's, that is amazing. I actually did notice how good the lighting was mm -hmm. and how good the sound was. And um, Joel, who took me to this performance, sat us right near the sound desk. He said, hot tip, yeah. sit near the sound desk. Exactly. This is where you get the good sound. Exactly. And uh, I'll be forever grateful. <laughs> Big shout out to Joel Osborne. All right. So we've talked about artificial intelligence, how it might be useful for marketing. Uh, you definitely gave us a whole bunch of things we can implement. We'll have this episode completely transcribed and accessible on superfastbusiness.com. James Taylor from jamestaylor.me is our special guest. And I want to say thank you for coming and sharing this. And thank you for sharing some of this inside Superfast Business membership. It's a classic example of how I learn more from my students by being in there and answering questions and observing the conversations than they'll ever know. I mean, I've, it's just a rich tapestry of learning for me. And, and I love to get a story like this and magnify it because we can be in front. If you're on to Watson now, you're in front of your competition yeah. and you're at the leading edge. So that's been a wonderful share. Thank you so much. I think it's, I mean, you've been a great coach to me. And I, I think this is the thing I've always found with memberships, like having created other ones in, in music is people join initially for the content, but they stay for the community and the character of the person that's leading that. And so from even myself included, I came initially becoming a super fast because I want that content or that learning in terms of being able to drive my business. But the reason that you stay is because there's you as the character of the person, but you know, behind it, leading it, but also the community of all those incredible other entrepreneurs that are in there as well, sharing their things and sharing their insights. And that's just sparking ideas from you. I love it. It's a beautiful thing. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm sure we're going to speak again uh, when I notice something else you post because you're a very <laughs> interesting man, James Taylor. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Discover how to build your business super fast. Check out superfastbusiness.com. Okay.